Hello there. In the last video, we talked about the variation between two different populations by taking two independent samples from population A, population B, looking at the variances of each of those samples, and testing whether those sample variances were significantly different from one another to imply that the variation between the populations themselves are significantly different from one another. We called this test the Fisher test, or simply the F-test. Of course, this is not the only parameter that usually is of interest to us. Uh, sometimes even more popular is analyzing the mean or measure of central tendency for the populations and seeing that there is a significant difference between them. One of the most famous measures of central tendency, of course, is the mean. So uh, one strategy is to take a sample from A and a sample from B and look at their sample means and see if there's a significant difference between them uh, to sort of test whether there is a significant difference between the means of the overall populations A and B. So there's typically uh, at least three different ways that you could conduct this uh, secondary hypothesis test. Uh, mu A equals mu B versus mu A does not equal to mu B, the two-sided alternative. Um, and it sort of depends on what you assume and how you sort of perform uh, the hypothesis test and sort of set up uh, the whole entire experiment itself. Uh, so this video is going to pretty much outline uh, how each of these three methods uh, sort of take place. And in the upcoming three videos, I'll do an example of each of them. All right, so case one. Uh, so case uh, one. Uh, so case one, so let's assume we have... Uh, population A and population B, and we're going to go in here and collect a sample. Uh, so I'm going to call this uh, sample S, and I'm going to call this sample T. All right, so what exactly uh, could one specify? So this sample could be uh, three people, let's see. So let's assume A is a particular state. Uh, you can call this, say, New York, and let's say this is Massachusetts. And let's assume that you move uh, to New York. Uh, so that means we're going, so move to Massachusetts. So let's assume you go over here. And let's assume a couple other people uh, go over here as well. So in this uh, sort of scenario, these two samples represent the same exact people, but under different uh, scenarios, constraints, or variability. Uh, so if this is the case, uh, what can we measure? Well, we can measure the happiness, the annual income. Um, we can measure a variety of things. It depends on sort of what you're interested in. Uh, but if we have this type of correspondence, namely there is a dependent, so dependent samples. If we measure the, uh, you know, before and after effects of certain types of things, or there's some other dependent relation between these two samples, then we can use what we call a paired difference t-test. So this would be a, called a paired difference t-test. And this is used if the samples between A and B are dependent in some fashion. And one of the most common ways is usually a before and after study. That's one of the most common uh, ones. All right, so how would one go about uh, a before and after study? All right, so that means we're going to have a sample A. So we have x1, x2 down to xn. And this is coming from A. And we also have a sample from B. I'm going to call it uh, y1, or I'm going to call it x1, x2 down to xn of B. Now, the sample sizes from A and B have to be the same because there has to be a dependent association between the two. Uh, so what we can do is we can calculate the sample mean of A. So this is going to be x bar A. And we can calculate the mean of B. We can calculate x bar B. And let us assume we want to test the null hypothesis that mu A is equal to mu B versus the alternative mu A does not equal to mu B. So one can find out that an equivalent way of doing this, we can define mu D to be equal to mu A minus mu B. If you define this condition, uh, that means the equivalent representation of the hypothesis is that the null is going to be equal to mu D is equal to zero, and the alternative is that mu D does not equal to zero. So one of the estimates for mu D, uh, given x, a, x bar A and x bar B, is we can define x bar D to be equal to x bar A minus x bar B. The difference of the sample means would be an, an approximation for the difference of population means.
So that's what we would get here. Okay, so once we calculate uh, the x bar b, x bar d, what else can we do? So we can also take these values, x1, x2, all the way down to xn of a. We can also calculate x1, x2, down to xn, b. And we can subtract these two vectors from one another. So once we do that, we're going to have another value here, x1, x2, down to xn, and this is going to be equal to d. So these are a bunch of differences. So what do I mean by differences? So if you have 3, 4, 5, minus uh, 7, 8, 9, uh, that's going to give you the vector uh, minus 4, minus 4, uh, minus 4. So that means everything is greater in the upper spectrum if you define it in that direction. Uh, so if you find the average of all these values, uh, you can realize that this x bar d is actually the same thing as this way of calculating it. They are the same. They are equal. Uh, but also from this set of differences, you can also calculate the standard deviation of differences. So the standard deviation of differences. Uh, so what is the standard deviation of the differences? Well, you can think of it this way. If uh, sample A, if sample A and sample B are approximately the same, that means uh, the sample differences is going to be approximately equal to zero. All of them. Now they might be one, two, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, or some decimals and so on. Uh, but if that is the case, then that means the mean uh, of this set is going to be equal to zero. And that means the standard deviation is also going to be equal to zero because the differences are going to be the same, relatively small. Uh, so these are some of the things that we have uh, that we can calculate. All right, so how would you sort of conduct a hypothesis test on this? So the confidence interval for the mean difference is going to be equal to, well, what can we use as a point estimate for the difference of means for the population? Well, x bar d is going to be a reasonable approximation, and there's going to be some error associated to that. I'm going to call it minus epsilon and epsilon. Some people represented by epsilon d or so on, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, where epsilon here is going to be equal to a t critical value times the standard deviation divided by the square root of m. I'm not going to dive into the theory of how this sort of comes about, but this may look familiar from our uh, simple uh, t-test for the population mean. So that's how you would uh, sort of conduct a hypothesis test for the difference of paired uh, samples for a paired difference t-test. And of course, if, if zero is inside your confidence interval, uh, that means you failed to reject the null hypothesis. And if zero is not in your confidence interval, then you're going to reject the null hypothesis, uh, where the null hypothesis states that mu a is equal to mu b. So that means if you reject the null hypothesis, uh, that implies that um, that implies that you're saying that mu a does not equal to mu b. That is, the averages are significantly uh, different from one another. So that's case A. And I'll do an example in the next video, as I said before. So case B. So case B follows under the condition that the samples, so sample S and sample T, from populations A and B. Here, let us assume S and T are independent. So again, let us assume this is New York and this is Massachusetts, and you want to sort of measure whether some people are more happy in New York over Massachusetts. So you would grab a set of people from New York, grab a set of people from Massachusetts. Let's assume nobody moves in between the two values, and you sort of measure their happiness. Uh, so these two samples have nothing to do with one another. Uh, that means they are independent. And this is also going to be the case for uh, case C as well. Uh, so what's going to sort of differentiate between case B and case C? Uh, so case A and ca case B and case C are going to differentiate between this. So case B uh, considers the case where the variances of A and the variances of B uh, are equal, and case C 
uh, is going to uh, look at the case where sigma a squared does not equal to sigma b squared. So the variances are equal or the variances are not equal to uh, these things. Uh, so you can test, use the f hat if you don't know. So if you don't know that the variances are equal or not equal to, you can use the f test to sort of uh, simulate whether these variances are equal to one another. All right, so case B is going to follow in this manner. So the first thing we're going to do is called, this test is actually called the pooled variance t-test. So if the variances are relatively equal to each other, you can pull the variances of the samples together and sort of weigh them based on their samples. Uh, so the pooled variance is going to be equal to the degrees of freedom for 1 times the variances of 1 plus the variance of 2 times the variance of the second sample divided by the degrees of freedom for the first plus the degrees of freedom for the second. Uh, so of course if you want the standard pooled standard deviation this is just going to be equal to the square root of the pooled variance. So this is called the pooled variance. And this sort of creates a weighted fair mean for the two sample variances sample variances so you don't have you know a small sample outweighing the variance of the other because you know higher samples should be weighted more heavily than that of the rest all right uh, so this is what we call the pooled variance and the pooled standard deviation so once you calculate these two objects once you have your samples uh, then you can calculate a marginal error which some people write as EP this is going to be equal to T times alpha over 2 times uh, the pooled uh, standard deviation times the square root of 1 over m1 plus 1 over n2. So you can't, so you shouldn't average the sample size together and use that as n uh, because that's unfair. Uh, so this pretty much creates a uh, good balance of these two. And you may also see some people write this as t alpha over 2 times the square root of sp squared over m1 plus sp squared over n2. Uh, I leave to you to algebraically verify that these are actually the same. All right, so once you have that, then your confidence interval, again, is the same. Uh, so the confidence interval from UD is going to be equal to uh, x bar D uh, minus epsilon P and x bar D plus epsilon P. And you would conduct the hypothesis test in the same exact manner. And here, the degrees of freedom uh, for your T distribution. So degrees of freedom is equal to nu1 plus nu2 or n1 plus n2 minus 2. They are the same exact thing. So case C is the case, again, where the variance of the first is not equal to the variance of the second population. So if this is the case, then that means you cannot pull the variances together. You cannot, or you should not, pull the variances together. Because if one has a significantly high variance than the other, then that means it's going to skew pretty much the whole entire set of the other one. So you want to sort of treat them as uh, separate entities. Uh, so here, the uh, standard error, so this is what we call EW, uh, because some people call this the Welch's t-test. Uh, some people also call it the unpooled variance. Unpooled variance t-test. So EW is going to be equal to T alpha over 2 times the square root of S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over uh, N2. Here we don't pull the variances together, so we treat the variances uh, in a separate manner. Uh, so the only difference here, this degrees of freedom, uh, since we do not necessarily know uh, the appropriate degrees of freedom, the approximation is typically going to be equal to uh, SA squared over NA. Uh, plus sb squared over nb, or actually uh, s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2, uh, the quantity squared, uh, divided by s1 to the fourth over n1 squared times nu1 plus s2 to the fourth divided by n2 squared nu2. Uh, and I'm not going to de really derive uh, where this comes from, but this is going to be the degrees of freedom uh, for the t-distribution. And of course, the same exact confidence interval applies. Uh, and if you're confused or don't understand how to use this, uh, we'll do an example of these three cases in the upcoming three videos.